Hey guys, it's Ryan. Uh, this will be the first video in a long stream of videos about orthodontic treatment because it's such a big topic and there's no way to cover all of orthodontic treatment in one video. So uh, we're going to try to focus on main things about uh, different appliances, about treating skeletal and dental issues, and just if you see a problem, how do you fix it? And so, you know, for orthodontic treatment, you usually look at um, unusual facial appearances, unusual facial proportions, unusual dental development, spacing and crowding, of course, and then there are a whole bunch of other uh, problems, which I listed here. And so most of these are like cross bites or uh, vertical deficiencies. So the first three here, posterior cross bite, anterior cross bite, and excess overjet, are all like in a horizontal plane. Whereas anterior open bite and deep overbite or deep bite are um, in the vertical plane. And you'll notice each one has a dental and a skeletal component. And the skeletal, um, if it's a skeletal discrepancy, dis um, skeletal discrepancy it's usually uh, correlates with some kind of class 2, skeletal class 3, skeletal class 2, something like that. So uh, this is a good list to know, to write down, and to refer to as I go through uh, all these things in the video. So just crossbite, what is it? So teeth overlap improperly. Um, if it's an anterior crossbite, it's in the anterior-posterior direction. If it's a posterior crossbite and the posterior teeth are overlapping improperly, it's in the transverse direction. And a crossbite, if you see a crossbite, you can characterize it as either anterior or posterior, and either skeletal or dental. So we're going to go through all the different combinations now. Okay, so anterior dental crossbite. So that's where usually it's caused by incisor crowding, um, and it causes the maxillary incisors to erupt palatally or lingually. So it might be just a few incisors. Here it seems pretty severe. It's, it's a whole bunch of incisors are infected. And what happens is it could typically present as like an end-to-end -end relationship where the incisors are touching and then um, if they bite down uh, further you can get a functional shift between initial contact and uh, full contact or between centric occlusion and maximum intercuspation and get a functional shift so that the mandible protrudes and so you might have started out as end-to-end -end when you first touch the teeth but when you bite down further the bottom teeth shift forward, and that's called a pseudo class 3 malocclusion because it's not really a class 3, but it looks like it when you're fully, um, fully biting down. Uh, this is a problem. Functional shift, if it's untreated, it can lead to tooth wear, to perio problems, um, and it's definitely something you want to treat as soon as possible. And if it's a dental crossbite, we can kind of get away with just tipping maxillary incisors labially as long as it doesn't mess up like lip support and we have enough vertical space to do that. So what can we use? Well, we can use just a removable appliance. It kind of looks like a retainer. And it has a couple components I want to talk about. So the Adams clasps are these things here. And that's just for retention, for holding this removable appliance in the mouth so it's not just falling out when the person's talking or something. So you have a couple of those to grab around the molars for good retention. It's made of an acrylic base. Um, there usually has one or more springs. In this case it would be for tipping the labial incis the maxillary incisors labially. Remember to fix the uh, anterior dental crossbite. And uh, Sometimes they have a labial bow. Sometimes it's for retention, but it's not really as useful as the Adams class uh, for retention. Sometimes it's used for a stop, like if uh, the orthodontist is worried that the spring will push the incisors too far labially and it has to be stopped at some point. That's what the labial bow would be for, but it's not really used that often. Um, sometimes you can add a bite plane or bite plate to uh, the appliance, just like a bulk of acrylic, to separate the upper and lower teeth so that when you're shifting things around, 
there's no like unintended occlusal interference. Like the two arches are separated, separated so that when you're moving teeth around, they don't bump into cuspal inclines and that sort of thing. So those are the different components. But I want to talk more about the spring because that's kind of there are a whole bunch of different springs and stuff. I think this is a really useful way to think about it. So if you have a paper clip lying around somewhere, go get it and bring it back. This is going to be super cool. I think it's going to really help. Um, so we're really focusing on the spring portion. It's actually a little bit hard to see, but there's a spring embedded in this acrylic that's pushing the teeth uh, forward. So if we think of this paper clip, it's like a you know, stainless steel wire. And I want you to take the end of the paper clip, this little part here, and bend it. So put a bit of force to bend it out like this. Um, so you permanently deform that metal. So you take your hand off and it stays in this, um, this arrangement. Now, once you get this far, I want you to take your finger and lightly push on the end of the paper clip that you just bent and bend it back towards the rest of the paper clip. So take your finger and just push it a little bit with the tip of your finger and notice that you feel a little bit of resistance and then when you let go it should go it should revert back to this shape. So I want you to think of this as your finger spring. Um, this part here, if we're not touching the paper clip and it's just sitting here, it's just sitting passively at this point. But as soon as we put some resistance on it, we put our finger, we lay it on the paper clip and push that bent arm, that is now activated and the paper clip is pushing back. It's saying, no, I want to get back to this, this shape. So that's, um, Essentially, when you're activating a spring, you're putting some force on, a, on an arm, on a, a, a limb of that spring, and it wants to push back. So it's pushing force um, back the opposite direction that you had to push to activate it. So now here's a finger spring. This is what it would typically look like in an appliance. It, it's composed of an active arm, which is going to be um, activated by you. It has a helix, which is this little um, wound up circle. It's usually like three millimeters of wire. And a retentive arm that's embedded in the acrylic base. So for, to get from here to here, that's like our paperclip example. We're just lightly pushing on the top part here on this active arm to the left. And I'm going to show you this in an actual like mouth example. Um, it can really work for about two to three millimeters of activation. Any more than that, it's not effective. You're, you're going to end up permanently deforming it. So you want it to be, um, you want it to be active so that it's actively pushing back against the teeth. And it can afford about one millimeter of tooth movement per month. It's also called the single cantilever system for a finger spring because there's one of these um, helices and one uh, lever arm. So this is just saying if we push uh, left on this active arm, we're in a sense activating it, and so it wants to spring back to the right. So let's put it in this uh, dental arch here. So the helix should be opposite to the direction of intended tooth movement. What does that mean? So here's our finger spring, and we're going to push it to the left. So it's this is kind of its original formation. This is where it wants to return to. And we have to push the active arm left so that it rests up against the distal surface of this incisor, say. And so when it's there, now it wants to push back to the right because it's now been activated and it wants to return to its original um, structure. So hopefully that makes sense if you, um, if hopefully what I'm saying makes sense and if you're working with the paperclip example, I think it should kind of play out and you can work through the concept and uh, hopefully that, that um, well, hopefully that makes sense. 
And usually, um, well, I should mention the helix should be opposite. So we were saying this finger spring is trying to move this tooth mesially in this example. The helix should be located on um, the left side. So if it's moving the tooth right, the helix should be moving to the left. And that makes sense because that's how you have to activate it. You have to bend it back. And usually it's mesiodistal movement. Sometimes it's facial lingual, but usually mesiodistal. Now here's a Z spring. It gets its name because it looks like a Z. Now we made it a double cantilever because we have a second beam with a second helix. So this is kind of like the finger spring. We added on an extra component. This is kind of nice because um, it gives us about three millimeters more increase in length. And if we remember back to our biomechanics and mechanics lectures or videos, um, increasing length of a wire is a great way to make it sp uh, more springy, increase the range of action, and this is done without compromising the strength too much. So it's pretty ideal. Um, you afford about two millimeters of activation per helix, and this time it's usually facial lingual tooth movement. So you'll see if we activate, here's our original um, our original structure. This is what the wire is going to want to um, return to. If we activate it by pushing it back, and then it's resting up against the um, lingual surface of these incisors, it's going to be pushing facially. It wants to return back to its original structure. Now let's talk about a fixed lingual arch. Um, it's banded to the molars, and there's this nice little uh, lingual wire, and there's this whip spring, so this is a little bit different. It's about 15 millimeters long. There are no helices or anything, and it just, um, you can imagine that this portion, this whip spring will have to be um, activated backwards, and then it'll push the whole um, incisor complex facially. And again, it's about one millimeter per month. It's important to note also that with these appliances, they're single point contacts. They're not edgewise, they're not braces where wires are contacting at multiple points. It's just one piece of metal touching one point on the tooth. So this is all going to be tipping, mostly uncontrolled tipping, which is okay because we're just fixing a couple millimeters. Um, and speaking of braces, another option for treating, remember we're talking about, um, we'll go all the way back here, we're talking about anterior dental crossbite. So let's go back. So another way to treat anterior dental crossbite, and perhaps one of the best ways to treat, is with a 2x4 appliance, which just means you have two molars that are banded, four incisors that are bonded, and you can do just a lot with that complex alone. Now, holy retainer is probably the best choice for retain for retention following the correction of a crossbite, either anterior or posterior. Get this nice piece of acrylic, decent retention. This time you would use the labial bow for retention because you're not trying to um, actively move teeth. This would just be a passive appliance for retention. All right, guys, I think I'm going to stop the video here. And the next time, we'll pick up with anterior skeletal crossbite. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.